Good evening, everyone. Uh, round three here for the day. Um, one of the great privileges of working at TICFA are, are some of the people that you get to spend time with, get to know, and really learn from. Um, and at the very top of that list for me is, is Elliot Abrams, um, as someone that uh, I've long admired. His intellectual work, his important role in American political life, um, and uh, in the last couple of years as a teacher. And so, Elliot, it's just as always great to have you here and, and to engage in a more freewheeling conversation, um, reflecting on your work and career, but through this lens of Jews and power. Um, so, why don't we start where you began in politics? What got you into political life in America? Was it a person? Was it a cause? Was it a set of ambitions? How did you begin your career in American political life? Well, it was uh, sort of interest and fun, I guess we'd have to say. I mean, I thought these were very interesting subjects. I was at Harvard. I was what you might call a um, democratic hawk. Um, the right-hand side of the Democratic Party. So, in 1968, when uh, President Johnson uh, stepped down, there was a big fight as to who would follow him. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, was the kind of regular candidate. And then there were people on the left, Bobby Kennedy, Eugene McCarthy, and I was not for them. I was for the harder line candidates. And I just got involved on the Harvard campus. Uh, what, what, what the step that kind of brought me into, brought me to Washington was Senator Henry M. Jackson. Um, in 1972, he did a kind of practice run for president. And I worked for him as a volunteer at Harvard. And said to him, you know, I'd be graduating and, and uh, if you're gonna run for president, I want to be there. So I graduated. Uh, I mean, I worked for him in the 72 campaign in Massachusetts. Um, he won the Massachusetts primary. Um, you take all the credit. I, mostly. <laughs> um, but um, I came down. Uh, in, so I graduated from law school. I started practicing law. I thought it was boring. Politics was much more interesting. And there was Scoop Jackson, and I hoped he would be president. This is the Jackson, you know, who, of the Jackson Amendment, so the single greatest leader of American, among American politicians, on the question of Soviet Jewry, and also as strong a supporter of Israel as anybody in American politics. An opponent of Nixon, opponent of Kissinger, opponent of Carter. Anyway, he did run. Um, he said he was running in 76. So. In 75, um, I really got sort of bored uh, practicing law, and I said, I'm ready if you are. And he said, come on down. So uh, I started working for him uh, in April 1975. And where, where did his pro-Israel, pro-Jew, hawkish views on foreign policy. Where did that come from? And what was he trying to accomplish? And then what drew yeah. you to it? The hawkish views were standard for the Democratic Party at the time. Uh, less and less as time went by. But I mean, there was Lyndon Johnson. Who, you can't name a bigger, a bigger hawk in the Cold War than John F. Kennedy. So this tradition of you know Harry Truman and John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Hubert Humphrey, Scoop Jackson, this was a this was the dominant position for a long time in the Democratic Party until it wasn't, which really happened at, because of the Vietnam War. Um, so Jackson came by it naturally, um, though he also used to say he was a Norwegian. That is, his parents were immigrants to the United States from Norway around 1890 or something like that. And, and he always used to say, you know, Norway is a wonderful country. Norway. And not just now, has always, you know, the whole 20th century, wonderful country. Didn't help them when Hitler came along. You know, whether you have good medical care, doesn't matter when Hitler comes along. What matters is, can you fight? Can you defend yourselves? And we're in the middle of the Cold War, that's the question for us. 
that was his view. So he was, like many other Democrats then, very much a strong defense guy. Now, what about the Jews? You know, I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, why on Israel? I'm just not sure, except again, you know, it's not, not so strange. Um, support for Israel among people who believe in a strong America, supporting American allies, it's not unique, it's not rare. Um, but he certainly was, and particularly then it was mostly in the Democratic Party, Republicans were not very keen on Israel. Um, so he was the leader of that group, but there were others in that group. Soviet Jewry, the question really is, and people can debate this forever, how much of it was Soviet Jewry and how much of it was it a chance to pound the Soviets? He was a cold warrior. He was against the salt treaties with Russia. <clears throat> he thought of Russia as, the phrase came later, an evil empire. Uh, it was Reagan's phrase, not his, but he certainly agreed with it. And here was a way of hurting the Russians, because what the Russians wanted, their economy was horrible, always. They wanted uh, trade with the United States. And in particular, they wanted money. That is, they wanted credits and guarantees because they couldn't pay for the trade. So they wanted the US government either to finance the trade or at least give insurance for the trade. And Jackson thought, this is nuts. This is helping your enemy develop his economy. But it's also true that you know it wasn't just a humanitarian gesture. He understood this is a way of hurting the Soviet economy and hurting, hurting the Soviet Union. Um, so he really became the leader in both of those. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's uh, the Jews. The, there were Jews in the Senate and the House. There weren't such leaders. They, they seemed reticent to lead these Jewish causes. Um, but Jackson wasn't reticent. So what did you do there? You were in your 20s. Well, when, before I went you to work. show up in 75. Yeah. What, I show up in What 75. is your job and what does it teach you in those early years of your career about politics, about political life, about power? Well, he's running for president. I mean, he's a senator, but he's running for president. I didn't have all that much to do with the Senate business, day in, day out, you know, pieces of legislation. Um, I was helping him get ready to run. So one thing I did was start talking to Jews, that is to say Jewish leaders, um, around the country. Um, as, as he began to put together his foreign policy, um, there were people working on the Middle East and Europe. And there was one guy on the staff who had had some courses on Asia, so he was going to do Asia. So nobody was doing Africa, so he said, you're Africa. So I became the Africa expert. You can imagine the degree of expertise that I developed, but it hardly mattered because no one was asking about Africa. So I was the Africa guy. And I did, you know, whatever came along. I mean, uh, somebody has to write a speech for something, okay, try your hand at writing the speech. Um, there were, but there were a number of things that, uh, to, to answer your second question. So I was a jack of all trades. Um, what did I learn about power? One thing I learned was you can't count on the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders are unreliable. Um, they are, I won't say cowards. But there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of reticence, where Jackson, whose nickname was Scoop, where Scoop would, would just take on the administration and say, this policy's no good, the Jewish leaders, well, we need to discuss this. We need to. So, and that included the two Jewish senators. There were two of them, Senator Javits of New York, Senator Ribicoff of Connecticut. Enormously frustrating, because they were always trying to they were, they were very interested in getting good editorial coverage in the New York Times. They were very interested in having the president and Kissinger think well of them. He didn't care. Scoop didn't care. He was for what he was for. So one of the things I learned was Jewish leadership, Jewish 
political elected officials, Jewish appointed officials, Kissinger, and others, um, and leaders of Jewish organizations were a very mixed bag. Um, I also learned that, you know, I, I came from a sort of, I, mean, New York, I was born and raised in New York City, um, and then went to Harvard. And there was a kind of intelligence that Jews value. You have to be quick. You have to be quick. You have to be very verbal. Um, you have to be able to make a quick speech on your feet. Um, Jackson was not like that at all. And one of the things that I learned was that what Jews viewed as political talent and intelligence was not necessarily right. <clears throat> um, Scoop was not an intellectual at all. It's another thing. Jews valued these intellectuals like Kissinger, Brzezinski, college professors. Um, Scoop was not an intellectual. He didn't read that much. He was just a great senator. There is a kind of political talent that is different from the one the Jews understood. The Jews understood as political talent the kind of thing that would make you a Harvard professor. Mm -hmm. If you said, Scoop would come in some days and he would say, um, that amendment I've been trying to pass, it's, I'm going to get it passed tomorrow. And I said, how are you going to get it passed tomorrow? There's no possible way it's going to pass tomorrow. I can name the senators who are against it. And he would say, I talked to Senator, these names won't mean much to the Israelis here, but I talked to Russell Long. Russell Long needs an amendment because <clears throat> he promised Magnuson that he would get this amendment. So I went to Magnuson and I said, if I do this, will you tell, and it is a Rube Goldberg device. It's 14, and he remembers it all in his head, and it works. The other talent he had, <clears throat> admittedly Washington State, which is where he was from, north of Seattle, much smaller than you know, New York, but it's not tiny. Seattle was a major city. The other thing he did was uh, he had great personal talents. That is, you know, someone would come to the office from Washington State. Where are you from? From God knows where. Everett, uh, uh, Tacoma. Well, so your name is Johnson. There was a Johnson who was the sheriff in Tacoma <laughs> 22 years ago. Is that your, you know, oh, that's my uncle. You know, it was that kind of retail <laughs> politics. Again, it's got nothing to do with being a Harvard intellectual. Was he the guy by in his church? Shimon Peres is the same. Pardon? Shimon Peres is the same. It is a great talent. I mean, if you're, if you're in politics, it's a great talent. <clears throat> and so one of the other things I learned was, you know, there's a lot of different ways of, of amassing power and wielding power that, uh, if you will, you know, Ivy League professors and most Jews don't know about or under rate. Um, one other thing, the best way to exercise power is to exercise power. <clears throat> Not necessarily a tautology, but I'll tell you a story. Scoop's um, chief foreign policy assistant was Richard Pearl. <clears throat> and there was a rumor that somebody, a story somebody told me, that there was, Scoop was opposed to the SALT agreement with Russia. And he knew there was a lot of support for this position in the U.S. military, which wanted to be tougher with Russia. But there were some generals who were going along with Nixon. And somebody told me this story, that Richard Pearl, you know, uh, <clears throat> in the U.S. system, to be promoted as an officer, you actually have to get approved by the Senate. Just as you have to be approved to be an ambassador or to be a Secretary of State, to be a general. And somebody told me a story that Richard had said, he's done. General Smith, never getting promoted. His career is over. I've taken care of that guy. We're going to. Ooh, this is mean, right? This is. And I said to Richard, because we were colleagues then, and stuff, <clears throat> I told him this story. And I said, so the story is that you said, so this guy's career is over. He opposed Jackson on this. He's done. And Richard said, oh, bet your life. That guy's finished. And I thought, now that's interesting. He wasn't ashamed of it. He wasn't afraid of it. 
this guy opposed the senator. The senator wants to show the military. You take him on, you pay a price. That's power. I just ruined your career. You're never getting promoted again. You're done. Um, you wield power by doing things. If you are afraid, well, I might fail, and somebody might be mad at me, that's not the way to, to get more power. The way to get more power is wield power, make people afraid of you, do things. That was at least what Scoop did. And I think it worked. He was a very powerful center. So one of the moments we looked at earlier this week, or last week, where it was the Camp David Accords. So what, what was Scoop Jackson's view of this in the late 70s? <coughs> what was your view of it? How did it look then, and how does it look now? How did he see Bagan as a state? <clears throat> By this time, um, I'm not working for him, um, so I can't give you a good answer on this. I think, you know, um, most American, just about every American political leader I can think of thought that the peace deal with Egypt was a good idea and hoped that it would be followed by a peace deal with Jordan. I, I just, I can't remember really opposition to that, partly because, you know, it was Begin, so you were, if it had been someone, well, someone on the left maybe couldn't have done it, but if Begin was doing it, it must be the right thing to do. So I don't remember Scoop expressing any uh, opposition um, to campaign. Um, he was already a little bit in, in opposition to Carter, but not on that issue. Not on that issue. I just don't remember any opposition on that issue. And I think it looks fine. I mean, um, I don't think um, it's sensible to think of Israel keeping control of the Sinai and making every Egyptian government um, want a war to recapture it permanently. Because the Egyptians were not going to walk away from the, uh, the Sinai. So I think, look, um, here we are in 2014. The security relationship between Israel and Egypt is very tight. The Egyptian army has more faith in the Israelis than in the Americans. Um, it certainly has not led to peace at the popular level. I mean, we all know that. that it, you know, you've seen the opinion polls. The Egyptians hate. The average Egyptian hates Israel and hates Jews. But from a security point of view, it has been, I think, a great success. Um, the old line, you know, that, that um, uh, Arabs can't make war without Egypt. It's true. That was the end of the period of, of interstate war. Uh, Arab states attacking Israel. That's not the threat today. So you were in and out of political life during the Carter years, the Reagan years, and the Bush one years. As you think about those three presidents and you think about the evolution of American policy toward Israel, how would you try to draw the outlines of that story? How are each of those presidents and their administrations different when it came to the question of Israel and Middle East? Well, there's a number of differences. One of them is I think Reagan had a real kind of gut appreciation for Israel. He liked it. I don't think Carter did, I think, and George H.W. Bush, the first Bush, didn't either. Just no um, gut level appreciation. Just no feeling for the place. Carter hated Begin. I mean, there's a number of ways to judge this. One is the sort of emotional, do you have an emotional feeling about Israel? <clears throat> Clinton did. Uh, Reagan did, less of one. Bush, the second Bush did. Then there's the leader-to-leader -leader relationship. And certainly Carter hated Begin. Um, and this is manifest if you read the accounts of Camp David itself. Um, Carter loved Sadat. But he thought Begin was just this sort of um, obstreperous, nasty, narrow-minded, uncompromising Polish Jew. 
Uh, and George H. W. Bush, of course, had the same horrible feeling about Shamir. There was just no relationship at the top, which, by the way, is interesting from the point of view of today, because the B.B. Barack relationship is not new. I mean, it's not the first time there has been a crummy relationship at the top. Um, the relationship, um, if you go back to um, Reagan, you know, there are ups and downs. We think of Reagan, rightly, I think, of, of being much closer. But after all, there were, there were moments of tension. There were moments that were very difficult for the United States in the region. For example, the uh, 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 marine barracks in, in Beirut, which led to some terrible mistakes on part of the United States. But, but um, I remember, for example, the, the um, Begin bombs the Iraqi nuclear reactor. The United States condemned this bomb. This is Reagan. And Gene Kirkpatrick in the UN casts a vote to condemn this action. Now, <clears throat> here is a case where I think, um, by the way, I was working, this is very early in the administration, Al Haig is Secretary of State. I'm an Assistant Secretary of State. <clears throat> Haig, of course, had been a general. Hay thought this was the greatest thing that ever happened. He, I mean, it was body language. You know, you could see somebody would give him a statement to read that would say, this is a terrible thing. But, you know, he was just reading the reports of this and sitting there thinking, wow. And he knew some of these Israeli generals and he thought it was wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, it was the cause of a falling out, actually, between Gene Kirkpatrick and me because I also thought it was wonderful. And I did not think the United States should have condemned it. And I wondered um, who was giving Reagan advice on this. And you know, if, if, uh, if he had, for example, suppose this had happened a little bit later and Schultz had been Secretary of State. I don't know. Um, uh, this is an example where Reagan is getting a lot of advice and it's not good advice. And he is, I would argue, misled by the advice. But, so the relationship has real ups and downs. I mean, the United States condemning Israel and the Security Council. Um, not doing anything in terms of sanctions, but if I remember right, the word condemn is in there. Um, but the relationship to those years is not nearly as close as we think of it under Clinton and Bush. That's 16 years of really close relations. Um, that's an achievement that comes only um, Clinton is 19, comes to office in 1993. Um, so this is pretty recent, you know, that this, the warmth in the relationship that we now think of many Jews in the United States, and maybe many Israelis think of as standard. So the problem with Obama is he has deviated from the standard relationship, which is extremely warm. Mm, not exactly. It's been, it's been uh, up and down, and and uh, uh, you have in those administrations people who are not friendly to Israel. For example, well, Carter was not friendly. You had it certainly in the George H. W. Bush administration, and Jim Baker, for example. But are these differences, you think, more rooted in just the personality and character of these leaders, or in fundamentally different? analyses of America's interests versus Israel's interests? Um, it's both. There, there are certainly, in the case of George H. W. Bush, sort of distance from Jews in Israel, in the case of Brzezinski. <clears throat> but there's an argument in those years about whether Israel is an important and valuable ally or a pain and a burden. Um, and that argument, I think, is a thread throughout all of these years. And Reagan, I think, comes to see Israel. His, his basic instinct is to see Israel as an important ally. I think that's the view of the Clinton administration, the George W. Bush administration. It's not the current view now. So this debate continues in the United States. You see it, you see it um, in the UN. That is, and it's partly. Uh, uh, the question is partly, what do you think of the UN, what do you think of the Security Council, but the United States is, is 
repeatedly forced to veto resolutions in the UN. Um, is this a price, a terrible burden of price we have to pay because of this relationship with Israel? We're forced into this. And I think in the Carter administration, the Obama administration, first Bush, the yes, answer is yeah. It's a pain. It's a price. We need to try to diminish the price. For Clinton and the, first, the second Bush, um, this is an ally. This, these are important things. This is what you do for an ally. What's the veto in the UN anyway? I mean, what's the? Why do we have a veto? So we can exercise the veto. Big deal. Um, but the more fundamental question is: uh, Is Israel a burden, or is Israel an important and valuable ally? And there are differing views. Of, differing views about this. I mean, if I do not think that in, in his gut. President Obama thinks of Israel as an important and valuable ally. I think he thinks of it as an annoyance and a burden. And from your perspective, as you looking back, looking at the current moment, looking ahead, are there places where you think America's genuine interests and Israel's genuine interests come into real conflict? Are there specific policy issues, cases where there's an actual divergence between the genuine interests of these two nations? Yeah, two well, <clears throat> yes. There's certainly differences on certain policy questions. Um, let me come to Egypt, because I think that's the most interesting example. But <clears throat> at the very fundamental level, no. In the sense that, you know, U.S.-Soviet relations in the Cold War, at the fundamental level, we are rivals, we are enemies. We cooperate sometimes, but fundamentally, we are enemies. Um, in the case of Israel, fundamentally, we are friends. And it is the policy of the United States that Israel should survive and thrive. So uh, at the fundamental level, there, there, there cannot be that kind of problem. Thus, you have the American saying, at least, <clears throat> we will not permit an Iranian nuclear weapon. And one of the reasons is we talk about Israel. Because existential threats to Israel we are against. We will not accept them. Whether you know whether we mean it or not is a different question. But but at the policy, the stated policy, yeah. Now, you can have different interpretations of what's in your interest. I mean, uh, when Israel bombed the Iraqi reactor, it was the position of the United States. That's not in our interest, it's against our interest. You shouldn't do that. Um, we aligned the interests when we attacked Iraq. Mm -hmm. And we said to the Israelis, it's bad for you to be in this war. Don't get in this war. It's just going to make it harder to get the other Arabs, so stay out. Um, I remember in the second Iraq war, um, so I'm talking 2003, um, Doobie Vice Class came to Washington and we talked about it. We said, stay out, like last time. And he said, well, we will stay out unless. And we tried to discuss. For example, if Saddam Hussein were able to send a bomber or a missile, and it lands on a hospital, it lands on a school, 200 Israelis are killed. He said, we're not staying out. We're bombing Iraq. If he sends a missile and lands in a field, OK. So we negotiated this because we had potentially varying interests that had to be um, harmonized. Uh, Egypt. <clears throat> Obviously, there are points at which Israel and Egypt are at war. We're trying to have a relationship with both. Today, um, the government of Israel is in love with President Sisi. In love with President Sisi. He's, uh, a, a top Israeli general said to me, and I quote, CC is a miracle. That's the Israeli view. It's not just, you know, the Bibi's view. It's not just the IDF view. The Israeli view. A couple of exceptions. Maybe one, Natan Sharansky. But I agree with Sharansky. I do not think it is in the interest of the United States to have a military dictatorship in Egypt, which 
is, in my opinion, unstable. Not going to work. What Sisi is doing is trying to eliminate political life in Egypt. He's not eliminating the brothers. Eliminate political life in Egypt. None. No NGOs, no civil organization, nothing, nothing. I don't think it's going to work. Now, I'm not in the government now, but if I were in the government now, we'd be arguing about this because I would be saying to you, because what the Israelis are saying is, leave him alone. We love him. Don't pressure him. Send him helicopters. But is your strength. view that the Israelis are right for Israel and you're right for America, or is uh, your view that the Israelis are getting it wrong for Israel? In this case, I would say the Israelis are getting it wrong for Israel in the long run. Here's the problem. Where the, where the interests <coughs> differ is the United States is able to look at this on a sort of five or ten year perspective, and I'm able to say, I think CC, you know, he may go for a couple of years, and then he'll be overthrown by somebody. Three years, not going to make it. And what Israelis are saying is, so call me in three years, but meanwhile, he's doing everything we want him to do. Look what he's doing with Hamas. Look what he's doing with Sinai. Look what he's doing closing the tunnels. Um, we're not interested in the long run. We're interested in tomorrow morning. So now that's probably a diversion, a, a, a distance, of, a, a difference of interest. But is your point about the instability of this regime? Excuse me. Let me. This is telling me that my battery is dying, which is it could be Egypt. Yeah. Uh, they're unhappy with this. <laughs> um, you said it was off the record. Uh, I lied. But, um, but, but there is, are, is your point about the instability of the regime, or is your point about the injustice of the both, regime? Both. Both. But one of the reasons it will, in the long run, be unstable is it is so repressive. Because you're pressing everybody, not just the Brotherhood. It's not going to work in the medium run, particularly not now after Career Square. Um, but there are other, I mean. <clears throat> what could they do? They, what, what, if you can be more specific, what can CC can do now? Which will be kind of like more. CC, CC won the office. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, first he did the coup. Mm -hmm. At the time that CC did the coup, everyone in Egypt who was not in the Muslim Brotherhood wanted him to do the coup. The Salafis wanted the coup. Liberals wanted the coup. Christians wanted the coup. Secular Egyptians, everybody wanted him to do the coup because they hated and or were afraid of Morsi. Everybody wanted So you have a united nation behind you against only the Brotherhood. <clears throat> okay, so crush the Brotherhood. He's not doing that. What I want him to do is stop putting in jail everybody who utters one word of criticism of the government or of the army, which is what he's doing. It can't work. It can work for a year. Maybe it can work for two years if the Saudis and Emiratis keep sending billions and billions of dollars. So that but, the Saddam so Mubarak did it. I mean, yeah, they did it. And they lasted they, for, for a few yeah. decades. Mubarak lasted 30 years. But it's 2014, and there has been Tahrir Square. People have seen it as possible to overthrow a dictator. And what are you doing to the Brotherhood, by the way? The, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood was not in those 30 years, it was not a violent organization. If you say, no protest, no politics, nothing, shut up, you're going to have violence. Because what you're saying, to, you're teaching a lesson that the only way to fight the government is violence. Because you're not allowed to speak out, you're not allowed to organize politically, we're not going to have free elections, we're not going to have uncensored newspapers, shut up. Well, I think that's a formula for violence. So, as you think in general about American strategy in the Middle East, and but let, let me yeah. stop and say so. You know, we see some of this in, in with, with other. I mean, I'll give you the best example. Um, there are moments where Israeli and American interests, as Israel defines them, you know, look. I, I here's the example: China. Israel gave sold some sophisticated military equipment to China. China is an enemy of the United States. And the United States was very, very unhappy. I, this is around two, 2000. And we um, 
it was a, it was a quiet crisis in U.S.-Israeli relations because we said you may not do this. At that point, we're giving you two billion four hundred million dollars a year in military aid, and we were exchanging information about advanced military technology, and you gave some advanced technology to China, and that is a, that is undermining the interests of the United States, and we will not permit it. It cannot happen again. Now, maybe it was in the interest, see, I could argue, in the long run, it's not in Israel's interest to do this, right? It's in Israel's interest that for the longest possible time, the United States be the strongest power in the world. So really, we have the same interest. But, you know, I don't get to define Israeli interests. The government of Israel defines them. And it defined Israeli interests as having an improved military exchange with China, and the United States said, yeah, well, that may be your interest. It's not ours. Stop doing it. And the Israeli officials who were involved in doing that were essentially uh, thrown out of the United States and not permitted to come back, including a couple of fairly high-ranking officials. Yeah, one. No names. Uh -huh. Who were told, you're not to come back to the United States again. Yeah. And essentially kicked out of their positions because they weren't allowed to talk to the American government. So there's an example of a real clash of interests. So as you think about American strategy in general in the Middle East, and think about the lessons of the Bush years and the lessons so far of the Obama years, what, what are the key lessons? And what are the key strategic errors that we've made and strategic possibilities in America has in managing a volatile Middle East? Well, you know, I, in, in a sense, I go back to the lesson I said about Scoop Jackson, and that is uh, power is a good thing to have, and it's a good thing to use. And within, you know, sort of sensible limits, using your power, you get more power. Um, and your allies, or potential allies, like to be allied with a powerful country, not a weak country, not a country that is unwilling to act. So. I think we were essentially right to maintain, really from, you might say World War II, certainly from the moment the British give up, they leave Aden in 79, and we take over. <clears throat> the United States is the key power in the Middle East. So, for example, when Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, takes Kuwait, we say, sorry, you don't get to do that. We reverse it. Um, I think that is the right policy. That is, we should be the dominant power in the Middle East, which means um, we should not let Iran be the dominant power in the Middle East. And I think we're making a great mistake right now in appearing to, because uh, I think it is the real policy, it appears to be the real policy to Arabs and Israelis, um, accommodating ourselves to an enormous increase in Iranian power. From the Sunni point of view and from the Israeli point of view, that's terrible because Iran is an enemy country to them. I think it's an enemy country to us, and I do not think we should be doing that. I think we should be seeking to consolidate, again, our power in the region. And part of that means you support your allies, like Jordan, Israel, um, <coughs> the Emirates, the Saudis to some degree here uh, as well. Uh, the bottom line, that's, that's the bottom line for me. Um, it is not good for the United States or our allies in the region for us to appear to be a weak or diminished. So what does that mean in terms of American actions? Well, the best example of it is the mistake the President made with respect to Syria. Um, Assad, the Arab Spring starts, there's an uprising against Assad. And we don't do anything. We do nothing. Now, the president got some good advice on this. Hillary Clinton, uh, Secretary of State, Leon Panetta, CIA, and then um, uh, Secretary of Defense, David Petraeus, head of the CIA, all say to him, we have to do something in Syria. We have to get rid of Assad. We have to build up the rebel forces. And he says no. And so we don't do anything. And the result? is horrendous. 
I mean, first of all, from a humanitarian point of view, it's a disaster. Eight million displaced persons and refugees, 200,000 killed, um, and ISIS. The Islamic State comes out of the slaughter of Sunnis in Syria. What, what is the message to young men in Morocco and, and, and Yemen and Pakistan? Come help fight the Shia. Your brethren are being slaughtered. You must join us. So uh, it's a disaster. The American policy in Syria over the past, uh, what is it now, three years? Um, and we had many opportunities uh, to change it. The first was, of course, in the beginning to support, to create rebel forces and support them. The second was the bombing the president didn't do. August 2013, draws a red line, backs away from the red line. Talk to any Gulf Arab or Israeli official about this set of issues they will mention. And then you backed away from your red line, um, which is, a, I think, a gigantic mistake that has repercussions in Iran, in China, everywhere else. So that was the second thing we should have done. If we had been starting in 2011 to create rebel forces that we had a good association with and that relied on us, and we had bombed Assad's air force and destroyed his air force, you would not have the ISIS that you have today. And you would have rebel forces, I think, that would be threatening the Assad regime and could probably beat his army and take over Syria. Remember, Syria is a 75% Sunni country. And those rebel forces would stand for what and govern how? Well, it depends on how much your, we, the United States, um, uh, put them together, lead them, help control them. But I would say to you, um, the basic problem in Syria today is uh, you have a, what is essentially Alawite, which is essentially a Shia government. The country is about 14% uh, Shia. There's no way that the Shia can run Syria except by killing people. Because the Sunnis don't want to be run by Iran and Hezbollah and, and the Alawites. So what kind of government are you going to get if you put these rebel groups together? Uh, first, they don't have to kill everybody because they have a 75% majority in the country. It's a much more stable situation in that way. Second, um, we have, you know, under, the, under my scenario, we have a lot of influence over these people. It is not the case, by the way, this is not Afghanistan, not the case that there are no uh, educated Syrian political leaders. There's a generation of Syrian political leaders who went to prison, who were imprisoned by Hafez and Bashar al-Assad, who could take part in a new government just as they have been taking part in, um, in Tunisia, for example. They're there. They exist. Um, the longer the war lasts and the less of an American role there is in it, you know, the more radicalized they get. Um, they're weak because we're not there. So who comes to the fore? Who's fighting Assad? John. So what were the biggest mistakes? Would it be a Jeffersonian democracy? No, but it would be better than the situation now. As you're thinking about no. American <laughs> strategy in the Middle East really fundamentally changed since the early Bush years, when you and others were articulating the democracy agenda, I mean, has the last decade plus fundamentally changed your strategic thinking? I'd say not fundamentally, because part of that strategy is American, I don't know, we're in its hegemony. Uh, America should be the strongest power in the region and should have an alliance network that includes Israel and the more responsible Arab governments against Iran. That has certainly not changed. Um, I mean, on the freedom agenda, so-called, you know, let me step back for a second. Look at the Middle East today from the Sunni point of view, not from our point. I had a Gulf Arab say to me, uh, I'll clean it up, so I won't use the foul language, but say to me, we don't mind. <laughs> We're on the record here. Grandchildren can watch it. Um, 
you Americans, when did you start bombing? You started bombing when the Yazidis were on that mountaintop and they were surrounded by Islamic State. Well, the of and they were yes, and they were gonna be killed. They might so you bomb. And he said, No, this is very interesting to me. This is a Gulf Arab Sunni. There aren't 15 people in the United States who know what a Yazidi is. But you had to bomb to save the Yazidis. 200,000 Sunnis are killed in Syria if you do nothing. But what am I supposed to conclude? You don't care. Slaughtering Sunnis is all right. Meanwhile, you're negotiating with Iran. Meanwhile, your president sends a letter, another letter, to the Supreme Leader. Meanwhile, you have a red line about the use of chemical weapons to kill innocent civilians, children, babies. This is the Alawite government of Syria, supported by Hezbollah and Iran. You don't actually need to do anything. From the Sunni point of view, you know, <clears throat> there's a right way for the world to be in a wrong way. The right way is, of course, the Sunnis are on top. The Shia are not. Now there's this Iranian effort to dominate the whole which Arab world. And you Americans are not helping us. Now add to this, who's fighting here? ISIS, what is Islamic? Who are these guys fighting in the Islamic State? These are young males, 98%. Who are these young males? These are marginalized young guys, whether they're from Rabat or Casablanca or Tunis or Amsterdam or Madrid. They are young men who have no lives. They have no job, they have no future, they have no wife, which is not insignificant. They have nothing. They are marginal figures in their own societies. They're worthless. Their lives have no worth, even in their own view. But then comes a message from Baghdadi. Worthless. None. You can be part of the greatest effort being made in the world now to build an Islamic state in accordance with Sharia. Worthless. Join us. Give your life meaning. Give your life. Maybe you have to give your life. But it's the greatest cause possible. Well, that's a pretty attractive. You're very nice. Choice. I know. <laughs> it's a great speech. It's, it's, uh, so I'm recruiting for that. Yeah, um, sounds like I don't give this speech to students. <laughs> um, it's. Uh, now, I had this conversation with President Bush about a month ago. It was in Dallas. Uh, we, and, we, and we talked about this. And his reaction was to say, well, we go back to the freedom agenda. What do you mean they're marginalized in, in, in their own countries? Europe is a different problem. But they're marginal in their own countries because there's no concept of citizenship. Because they have no... Um, future in their own countries because they have closed economies with no social mobility and no economic opportunity because there's no political life which they can join. Um, that, that's what we were saying, the President said, in, in 2005, let's say, in 2004. No, January, it's the second inaugural, January 2005. That's what we were saying. You will keep on getting recruits until you change those societies. Yes, what we have to do now is military action and police action. But more fundamentally, we have to address the problem that creates those people in their societies. We are not going to win this just by bombing, or just by policing. We have to also address the societies that produces, for example, the Saudis who did 9-11. So fundamentally, I think that's still True. It does not mean that uh, until they are all Jeffersonian democracies, we're doomed. But it does mean, you know, and we didn't say that. I mean, we were not in those years of the freedom agenda. We were not saying to the Saudis and the Emiratis, you know, monarchy is a bad idea. You should resign, and, and you should have an election. We're not saying that. What we were saying to them was, look, there has to be some kind of relationship between the ruler and the ruled, between the royal family and the people of this country. There has to be some kind of partnership. They have to have a life. They have to have a future. If it isn't a, if, if, we're not talking about democracy here, although we did say sometimes 
maybe some political life, municipal elections, some way of people to be involved in their country, at least economically. Now, it, it's interesting that when the Arab Spring happened, the reaction of the King of Saudi Arabia was to announce a $120 billion plan. It's nice to be rich. To do what? To create jobs and to build housing. And that's very smart. Because these young men, why don't they have wives? They don't have wives because they don't have houses. In Saudi Arabia, that's the pattern. Yeah. That's very smart. I don't actually know if the king followed through or to the degree to which he did. It's very smart. If you can give those young men a job and a wife, one wife, two wives is a luxury, you know, but <laughs> one wife anyway, um, you will diminish the attractiveness. Do you have any evidence for this? So you have this theory that democracy will not radical. If they just had democracy, if they could just vote for municipal elections, they would stop being radical. Did you have any support for this? And any evidence, yeah. or is this something that you've uh, The evidence I would give you is um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Tunisia. But it's a different that, Well, Tunisia is not. Um, the first election after the dictatorship ends is going to be won by the best organized force, and that's usually the Islamists. The question then is, can you have a second election? Because if you can, they're not going to win. And we saw this in Tunisia. Right. And even in Egypt, you know, remember, Morsi won 51-48. It was very close. The reason that I was, I thought the coup was a good idea was it seemed pretty clear to me, as it did to most Egyptians, he's never going to have another election. Mm -hmm. This is their chance to take power, and they're going to keep it. But, but. I why guess did people, I guess in why, Iran, we're just waiting for the second election. We were problem. waiting for an election, and there is no possible way that this regime would win an election. If you had a plebiscite, do you want the Islamic Republic, or do you want a Western-style democracy? There is no possible way. But we're never going to get these elections. Well, this regime has to be overthrown, and it has to be overthrown by mass action. And there was some in 2009. It's another problem with right. Obama. There was some. But... You asked a different question, and my answer is pe people vote Islamist in the first election partly because there are very few alternatives and fewer organized alternatives, and the Islamists cannot deliver. And they don't deliver. And I mean, it's, had Morsi not tried so much to consolidate power, and had the army left him in and there had been a second election, I don't believe they would have won. Because what did he produce? He produced nothing. Certainly in, in economic terms, he produced nothing. We've seen that in other Muslim, admittedly not Arab, but in other Muslim countries. Why did Inato lose the election? They didn't produce anything. They had power, and people felt they failed. They will, I think, always fail because, this is a biased, non-Muslim view, Islam is not the answer. It doesn't tell you how to run, put aside democracy, it doesn't tell you how to run a decent economy. And they only realize this at the moment they have a government, Islamic government. For 40 years, they think Islam is the answer. They look, become extreme, but then one no. moment there's an Islamic government, look at, then they look realize at, it's not working. Look at um, Egypt under Mubarak. Moderate, secular, liberal, democratic forces are crushed. Brotherhood is not crushed. The Brotherhood is not crushed. On the day Mubarak fell, every Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood leader was in Cairo. They're not in exile. They're not in jail. They have 88 seats in the parliament. They would have had more in free elections. But Mubarak let them have 88. That's pretty, that's a lot. So what Mubarak is doing is saying there are two choices. And he then engineers it so there are two choices. There's the Muslim Brotherhood, and there is the National Democratic Party, his party. He doesn't permit there to be another alternative, even a moderate Islamist alternative. There were people trying to form moderate Islamist parties. He wouldn't let them form parties. So what do you think happens when... when uh, now, I'm not suggesting that it's going to be a stable democracy. 
But I am suggesting that it is not inevitable that the Islamists win elections. The, the kind of democracy that they would have would be one that we would not like to live in because, for one thing, Islam would be a hegemonic religion. There's no question about that. We're going to go back to the Dini idea of you know, tolerance, mere tolerance of non-Muslims. Um, and, and the question of, of women and sexuality more broadly, I think, also is not going to be anything that Westerners would like or Israelis would like. Some Treatment, Israelis. Um, right, non Haredi Israelis. Really. <laughs> um, Treatment of homosexuality. Treatment of women. Um, but I don't accept the view that um, the Islamists are going to keep winning elections. So the more democracy you have, the more jihadis you get. So one more question for me, and then we'll open it up. How would you evaluate Netanyahu's statesmanship over the last few years? And what do you see as the most concrete and pressing challenges and options for the next Israeli prime minister, whoever that may be? Netanyahu's statesmanship. There is one example of uh, a real significant achievement, and it is statesmanship. We would not um, have the, these European and American attitudes toward Iran if Netanyahu had not had his campaign against Iran, including the threat of Israeli military action. He played that very well. Um, why are there sanctions against Iran? Because he persuaded the European, uh, the EU3, Germany, England, and France, and many other countries. Iran, A, Iran is dangerous. B, if you don't do anything, you're leaving it to Israel. It worked. It was a, a, um, it was a good concept of a foreign policy, and it was then carried out by Netanyahu and other officials of the Israeli government successfully. I think that is a, that's, what can you ask of a, of a small country of seven million people that, you know, doesn't, not a superpower? Um, the usual example, oh, 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 let me add to that. I'll give you two other successes of Netanyahu's statesmanship, India and China. Israel has never had a better relationship with India and China than it has today. Now, you can say, well, it's not Netanyahu, another prime minister would have done it. Who knows? He did it. He did it. It's pretty damn good. And the trade figures, up, 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 up. Now, can, is, so the two questions on the downside, do you hold him responsible for what's going on in Europe, which is to say uh, boycotts, sanctions? Western Europe. Uh, Western Europe. Um, the parliament's voting for A and B. Do you hold him responsible for the poor relationship with the United States? Uh, as to the latter, I don't. I don't. I, I really hold the United States more responsible. Um, I remind you that Obama became president before BB became prime minister from this round. Obama becomes president January 20th, uh, 2009. BB comes a few months later. The relationship is bad from day one. It's not BB's fault. He hadn't even done anything yet. He hadn't been prime minister. Now, some of it is there are people, Dennis Ross, Martin Indyk, who don't like him from before. They remember him from the 90s, from the Clinton administration. But that's America's problem. Not, I mean, that's America's doing, not something that BP did now. Um, and, you know, what is the first thing the president does? Day two of his administration. January 21st, he appoints George Mitchell as our Middle East negotiator. And Mitchell immediately takes the position, no construction in settlements, by which he means Jerusalem and Ma'ale Adumim. Now, what do you think Bibi's going to do? He's going to freeze construction? New prime minister, the coup prime minister, is going to freeze? This is nuts. And by the way, we in the Bush administration had reached a deal with Sharon about this. 
which they threw away. I'll talk more about that later. But so I don't blame BB. There are things you can blame him for. There are moments you can blame him for. But I think the spiral downward comes out of Washington. And I don't, you know, my impression that Israelis can have a different view, and maybe I'm wrong. But it's interesting. You know, we always said, for, for 30 years we said, managing the relationship with Washington is the most important thing for an Israeli prime minister. And if it's bad, he will be blamed, and he'll be punished, and he'll be, and I think, the, you know, this didn't happen with Obama because so many Israelis concluded, look, he doesn't like us, he's not supportive, it's not Bibi's fault. And then you get uh, proof of it, or not proof, evidence of it. This amazing comment from a high White House official, chicken shit. Nobody talks that way about Iran, nobody talks that way about China, nobody talks that way about Putin, nobody talks that way about Venezuela or other hostile countries. Only that, so it's a sort of cast of um, of mind um, that you know it just sort of shows you what the attitude is, and again, I think suggests. But didn't it undermine the American position to say that? I mean, yeah. the threat of an Israeli strike strengthened America's hand in negotiations. Well, the worst, the, way, the, way the much worse part of that statement from. American officials was the one about Israel and Iran. That we're very lucky, you see, we, in 2012, we might have bombed Iran, we stopped them, and now it's too late. You know, this is really stupid. We're in a negotiation with Iran. We need pressure on Iran. You announce that you think that pressure is removed. This is in the interest of the United States. This is a, this is a fool in the high reaches of the administration who is more interested in scoring point against Bibi than in the negotiations with Iran. And remember, this is not an off-the-record comment. This is a background comment, which means it's on the record, but you can't name the person who said it. But you know it will be printed. Now, I, I don't see how you can blame Bibi for that. Now, can you blame Bibi for the European? Well, uh, you can blame the Israeli right wing if you want to. That is, you have a lot of uh, Europeans who believe that there should be no construction at all, not in small settlements and outposts beyond the security barrier, not in Gush Etzion and Ma'ale Adumim, not in Jerusalem. So that's Israeli policy, to build. If you had a different government and a different policy that had said 100% construction freeze, if that's conceivable, maybe you wouldn't have the same reaction in Europe. I don't blame Bibi personally for that. That's so how would you advise the next prime minister when it comes to Israeli <coughs> security strategy, the concrete things that it should do or shouldn't do? Well, the next prime minister, you know, it might be Bibi. Mm -hmm. um, so you won't ask. For more advice. You have to rush to Jerusalem for this to happen. Uh, you know, the, it's a very fluid situation. I think it's perfect. Remember, the election is not for months. Yeah. It's a long time. Once upon a time, once upon a time, BP, <laughs> you say, was elected by terrorism, right? Mm -hmm. But whoever it is at a but policy let, level. But, well, first of all, you need, you need to try for a fresh start with the Americans, if that's possible. Uh, particularly if you have a new defense minister, a new foreign minister, if you have any new ministers, that can help. A new prime minister can help more. Try. Uh, you need to try to restore the credibility or enhance the credibility of the Israeli military option. One of the things that I would say to, if, I, if I'm advising the new prime minister, is hey, look, it's bad for the Americans, it's bad for the Israelis, for there to be no credible military option. Everybody has to recognize it. Even if you think, I'm never going to do it, so talk to the Americans about what can be done, what can be leaked, what maneuvers, what steps, what statements, to give the Iranians the impression that it's back on the table. Um, I would seek some kind of understanding on settlements, which has become such a big deal. And that's the Americans. The Americans made it a central feature of the way it had never really been before. Can you reach some kind of understanding 
Not that there'll be an agreement, but an understanding that will diminish the constant public condemnations and arguments over this. We did it, we did it with Sharon. It is probably doable with Bibi. It's certainly doable if you have a more left of center um, government. Uh, on the Palestinians, you know, uh, nobody, even John Kerry, I think, no longer believes a comprehensive agreement is possible. There's a year and a half more of the Obama administration. Uh, and only a year until we really get into political mode. Now, both Clinton and Bush went almost to the last day. But you know, a year and a half is not much. I don't think even Kerry believes you could do a comprehensive mm -hmm. agreement. So what can you do? I would sit down and say, look, my boss would sit down and say to the Americans, there's not going to be a comprehensive peace deal. There's no evidence whatsoever that boss wants one. But I'm here. He's there. You're there. Let's just talk about the next year and a half. How do we minimize <coughs> friction and maximize whatever concrete positive steps we can take? That would be my advice. Um, and the question, the big question for Israeli prime minister is not the Palestinians. Nothing's going to significantly late change there. The question is Iran. But, but how That's, do you see the so relationship? Uh, just calling to this, uh, uh, your last sentence, how do you see the relationship between uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Obama administration? Well, um, there's no public, not much public criticism of Abu Mazen, but people know that he said no to the president. People know that he came to the Oval Office and he never gave an answer. Um, when I say, I've been saying this one line <clears throat> since the day I left the government. So this is getting on to six years ago. The one line is, Abu Mazen is never signing anything. And people in the Obama administration would look at me as if I were some kind of right wing not who hates Palestinians. When I say it now, when I say, look, you've dealt with him for six years, it's not signing anything. I do not find people saying, what, what? I find people saying, yeah, probably. So let's open it up. Yes. I, I want to get to two uh, issues um, that um, small, perhaps, but indicative of what you were talking about. And also what you were talking about before as, a, as an official in the American administration on the Jewish issue. Americans do not recognize Jerusalem as the capital. Right. We, just like, um, I guess in November it was, um, Supreme Court Judge Sonia Major, I don't know if you're following the case. Very interesting case, Zivitowski. you know, you all know the case. Zivitowski. Yep. The passport. Yep. She, uh, she expressed herself in an angry fashion in that case, the, the representative of the, of the father and the son, the, the, the one who put the appeal to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court took the case, which is a unique case. The case is that the, someone who's born in Jerusalem, the kid, and the, um, uh, they don't want to put that he was born in Israel, because Israel is not recognized as the, as the capital of Israel. As, and uh, they were trying to, this is an appeal, that uh, to, uh, whether, whether this can be done or not. She expressed herself angrily that Jerusalem cannot be, this is a lie, she said, Jerusalem is not going to, is not part of, it's not, is a, we do not recognize it as Israel. All the administrations um, mm -hmm. never changed this policy. Mm -hmm. And this is something very troubling. I mean, it's literally undermining Israel in a, in a significant fashion. I'm not talking about East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. It's important to remember, America does not recognize West Jerusalem as Israel. Um, and that, of course, comes with all the other issues of, the, of, of building and so on. And, and I have so many questions, but this is an interesting question to me, to you. Um, what, is, what is the policy? What, what, uh, where, how can you start to change this policy? It's a critical issue. The second question, I would, you, you talked about the veto. I understand, and maybe I'm wrong, that America is not going to use the veto this time. No, I don't agree. Okay. I hope I'm right. I, believe me, I hope yeah. you're right. 
I'm not saying the, that I hope I'm right. The problem so Jerusalem is, and the veto. Okay, yeah, the, the, let's start the, 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 the question right now is, here is Netanyahu. You declare the two-state solution. Everybody's recognizing a Palestinian state tentatively, if not de facto, so de jure. Um, we are not going to accept the Palestinian um, uh, a plan for two-year moving, but we will work with you, Netanyahu, whoever comes to be the Prime Minister of Israel. That's why this election is so critical. And, and, and we are not going to, we are going to build this, that we recognize the Palestinian state, we agree. You agree, Israelis agree. And, and we will not, we cannot use the veto this time. I think that the first, it's easy to veto now because there's an election. Maybe, it's maybe, very maybe, easy maybe, to say, that's an interesting point. hey, yeah. come on, in the middle of this, yeah, that's an interesting you can't. Point. So I, um, I, <clears throat> when I, I was in Israel, what, two months ago now? Mm -hmm. Getting on to two months ago. I saw Bibi. And the, the conversation we had about this was actually not so much about the American refusal to veto, but rather what price yes. would the administration Extract. seek yes. what's so hard for us to veto. Yeah. We can only veto if you do. One, two, three, four, five. That was the conversation. Yes. Um, I think the administration recognized that it, it must veto in the end. I think Abbas is probably smart enough to slow down now until after the Israeli election. And if Bibi is defeated, then you know you have to wait again because you have to see what's the new government, what are its policies, you have to talk to them. So I think there's a an extension here of, of uh, so a number of months. So if the president will not bring it for vote? If they're smart, because the Americans will easily veto at this when, time. When is the day for the vote? In January. So, well, but you could do it whenever you want. Yeah. Um, so the pressure, it seems to me, is off on this mm -hmm. one for, for a while now. Um, one difference here, I have to say, is Republicans, generalization, Republicans don't like the UN, Democrats like the UN. So for us in the Bush administration, I used to say to people, any day that you can veto a resolution, veto and go home, because you're not going to do anything better that day. You have the best <laughs> moment of that day. In fact, take a week off. That was our view. Veto, vetoes were fun. The Democratic view is, oh, it's going to be isolated. It's terrible. How could we end it? Oh, it's terrible. Let's negotiate, and we, which, is, which is tactically, of course, bad. Because once the others, the Arabs in this case, know you really, really, really don't want to veto your negotiating power in getting a resolution you can accept has just gone down, obviously. If they think, I'm oh, sure I'll veto, I'll veto in a second. Then, when you come to negotiate, you can say, OK, put something on the table. You know, I'm happy to veto this. If you want me not to veto, give me something really good. Um, that, and that, as a generalization, that's the difference between Democrats and Republicans. But now, so this is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, this yeah. is it, Can I quote you on this? <laughs> on what? <laughs> on the veto. <laughs> I'm just asking. Sure. Yeah, because it's a very interesting observation. I haven't heard it, that, that this and delays look, the, this think delays. of the Republican ambassadors. Yes. There have been a few who have been career diplomats, but then you've got Jean Kirkpatrick, yes, John Bolton. Sure. Their attitude toward the UN is obviously quite different yeah. from, let's say, Samantha Power. Sure. Um, Jerusalem. The, the line has been, look, nothing is more sensitive than Jerusalem. I remember speaking to one Arab uh, foreign minister in, in one of the monarchies. And I said to him, this is uh, 2008, I, so we're negotiating, right? It's the owner is still negotiating. And, and I said to him, look, on the question of the border, uh, which is, you know, he stopped me. He said, I'm not in the real estate business. <laughs> and I said, now that's an interesting comment. And he said, whatever they agree is fine. We have only one concern here, and it's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is more sensitive to Arabs. We can argue from now to the end of the year about, you know, well, but it's not mentioned in the Quran, and, it, and it's only because the Jews have Jerusalem that now it's a, but it is an issue now. Let's face it, it it's is a kind of declaration. an issue in Arab countries and Muslim countries. Um, so it's sensitive. So the position of the United States has been, we don't want to touch this. We're not going to touch this. We're not going to do anything about this. Now, it is, for the reasons that you state, it's, it is not a sensible position. Abu Mazen is not claiming the right to the Knesset. 
Not yet. Um, <laughs> and I think there are many Israelis who would say the Knesset can have. <laughs> but he's not claiming the right to West Jerusalem. He's claiming the right to East Jerusalem. The United States could say, look, the, some borders are pretty well settled, and some are not. Um, why do we have, why, do, why can we have a, an embassy in Tel Aviv? Because we know that Tel Aviv is not going to be part of a Palestinian state, whatever the, and the same thing is true of West Jerusalem. Whatever the borders, they won't include West Jerusalem, the borders of the Palestinian state. I will interrupt one. People forget that Jerusalem had numerous amb embassies yes. before Israel adopted the law right. that made Jerusalem its, its the last United capital. Last will After that, there are no embassies. Latin Americans were... Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, the argument you'd have to make, see, I, I think, I, I have made the argument uh, and lost. Um, why would it be important for the United States to do this? Because the United States would be saying, look, at least this part of the argument's over. Jerusalem, the whole city of Jerusalem, is not up for grabs. There's an argument about East Jerusalem. First of all, there's an argument about what's Jerusalem, and is Shu'afat Jerusalem, but there, uh, um, there's an argument about East Jerusalem. The Palestinians claim it should be their capital. Um, they don't claim that of West Jerusalem, so we could put an embassy in West Jerusalem. Um, no administration has taken this view. By the way, if you go back to the campaigns, everybody, everybody promises to do it. Yeah. We did in the Bush administration, we did from the day he was elected president, or actually from the day he was inaugurated, we made a list of all the campaign promises that Bush made in his campaign for president in 2000. And we kept a list over those eight years so that we could see how are we doing. And Josh Bolton, who was chief of staff, said the only campaign promise he clearly, absolutely did not meet was to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And I think his, his argument would be, well, we were negotiating, we had the Arabs, we had the Palestinians, you gain something by this, but you lose something by this, and they're very mad at you, it looks like you're too pro-Israel. We thought in the middle of these negotiations we shouldn't do it. The Arabs certainly didn't want us to do it. We have lots of difficulties with the Arabs, and we had 9-11, and then we had war. You know. So there is um, an argument there, but does that not clearly say something about Arab intention, though, that they have a problem with something being built in West Jerusalem? Sure, and I think you could explain it. There are other arguments that people make that, um, well, wait until there is a declaration of a Palestinian state. Even if its borders are not final, uh, then you could say, okay, we're going to agree that there's a Palestinian state now, but we're also going to move our embassy to Jerusalem. There has to be some sort of balance here. Uh, Obama's clearly not going to do it. In the next campaign, everybody will also promise to do it. But, uh, you know, the world is changing. It's, it's not inconceivable to me that it would happen. The Supreme Court decision is probably, I think, going to go for the administration. Yeah. It's just my guess. The president, the executive branch, gets the right to decide this. Thing. Maybe I'll be surprised. Yeah. You mentioned the lessons that should be taken from the civil war in Syria. I wanted to ask you if you think that the U.S. should be afraid from the, the revenge that would come in two aspects. One aspect is the international aspect that states like in the Gulf or in the Gulf, in the Gulf area would say that U.S. is not a uh, Someone that it's not a state that we can count on, which means that uh, perhaps they will become more and more friend with the, the eastern part. And we have heard that the the Cold War is beginning again. So perhaps they will find somebody else that is would be an ally beside the U.S. And the other thing is, should the U.S. be afraid from um, a terror or revenge? from the Sunni who thinks uh, this is the time to, to pay to the, to, to the U.S. 
on this second part, um, you know, these are terrorists. They're constantly trying to attack the U.S. I mean, they haven't succeeded, but they came, they've come close. The attacks continue. Um, would we make it worse? Would we make ourselves more of a target? I don't think so. I mean, Baghdadi has said, you know, the first target is the near enemy here. We're fighting the Shia here. After that, you know, the second enemy is the Saudi royal family. Israel and the United States come later. I don't think we change their list of priorities by fighting them, and we're doing it now, you know. So we perhaps are it would explode the revolution, you know. They'll try, but, but we can't accept this argument because then what we're saying is we're afraid of them. We're, we are terrorized, mm -hmm. so we're not going to do anything because they might attack us. They'll attack us when they get around to attacking us. Meanwhile, we should try to kill as many of them as we can. So I don't, I don't, um, Al-Qaeda didn't attack us because we attacked them. They attacked us because they wanted it. They, want, they believed in it. They believed it was a useful thing to do. And that will be true of uh, the Islamic State as well. I don't know that we can. There's nothing we can do that would eliminate the threat, <coughs> except to kill all of them. And do you think people, the other states will think that they cannot rely on, uh, on well, the U.S. as the airline? Uh, the problem is there's no alternative. If, if, you were, if you're looking at, it, it, let's say, Egypt, Egypt, Israel. with Russia. But it's nonsense. Russian military equipment is mostly crap. They have a few good things. They don't want to buy Russian military equipment. They want to make a protest to the United States. Watch out. Don't take us for granted. We have other options. They don't want to do that. And if they do it, they'll be sorry. Because how do you integrate into the 100% American equipment they have new Russian equipment that you've got to be trained on. The Jordanians, what's their option? Saudis, Emiratis, Kuwaitis, Bahrainis, what option do they have? China? There's no China option. China can't protect them in the Persian Gulf. If the Strait of Hormuz is closed by Iran, China can't open it. Only the Americans can open it. Why, so, are, you so, why are you so sure? That China can't do it? Well, the Tony America, Ameri Ameri America can do it. Well, because it requires, it requires a very, a, the application of a large amount of air and naval power. If the Iranians close the Strait of Hormuz, we will destroy the Iranian Navy while opening the Strait of Hormuz, sure. which is why I don't think they'll do it. But no one else can do that. The British can't do that. The Chinese can't do that. They don't have the kind of expeditionary force that can provide. They have no bases. So. There, the other options exist in part. For example, should Israel have try to expand its trade with India, China, and the rest? Absolutely. Very smart. So should we. But from a security point of view, there are no other options. For Israel. For Israel. Of course. Well, for Israel, for the Gulf Arabs, for Jordan, for Egypt, I think. I have two minor questions. One just on the Follow up on the Jerusalem issue. To what extent does the Cairo Declaration, was it 1980 or 1981, where the Arab League declared any state that moves its embassy to Jerusalem will break all of us collectively? To what extent does that actually carry weight in the calculations here? Uh, people don't, mention usually, it people don't mention it. Uh, maybe because they have forgotten it. Or it's a norm, or it's, it's what? Because it's never been repealed? But, I mean, it's not the implicit threat. I don't think Does it's the United States really believe that they would follow through no. on that? No. Or any other I mean, that's European the thing. Country. I mean, they're really going to? Yeah. But that's one thing. The second question is um, just on Syria. You mentioned that um, Panetta and Clinton and Petraeus came to when, when the Syrian uprising was in its early stage, that something had to be done. Right. And Obama said flat out no. Could, could you give us maybe more insight on what his motives were at the time? Did the Iraq negotiations with Iran was a factor in his decision, or was it simply his own aversion to doing anything? Um, well, there are a number of theories. One theory is, you know, he's a bad president. He has an aversion to anything. He, he's weak. There's that line of Republican argument. A second line of argument would be, you know, he's right. 
That is to say, he looked at this and he thought, it's a quagmire. I was elected to get out of quagmires, not get into them. And these guys are weak, and they're not going to be easy to organize into a force. Um, and whatever we do, Iran, Hezbollah, Assad will counter it. So that's the quagmire. Oh, sure, we could train a thousand of them. They'll send a thousand Quds Force guys. You, you, this, this is going to be, I don't care what the advisors say. This is exactly what I don't want to get into, an endless Middle Eastern war. Then we'll have 1,500 advisors, then we'll have 3,000 advisors, then we'll have 10,000 advisors. <coughs> the other argument, the third argument is Iran. That is that you remember the president makes an outreach to Iran in 2009 when he's elected. Um, he writes a letter to the Ayatollah in 2009. Um, he wants a rapprochement with Iran. He believes this will be one of the most significant events in world politics since 1979 to end this fantastic hostility between the U.S. and Iran. So you're going to get into a kind of war, a proxy war with Iran. It is a proxy war with Iran. We're not in it, but it is a proxy war with Iran. He doesn't want to do that. He wants a rock push ball with Iran. I would add my own opinion. The thing is, the Ayatollah Khamenei does not want a rock push ball in the United States, which is why there is, has not been one. And there isn't going to be one, in my view. But I think, I think those are the things that affect the president. So, uh, the daughter of another Baghdadi, Hassan Rouhani, I have to ask you about uh, Iraq, uh, because I Real believe... Baghdadi. Huh? A real Baghdadi. Yes, my father, <laughs> bless his soul. Um, He's not from ISIL. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Bag from uh, the city of Baghdad? Yes. Um, <clears throat> he came to Israel when he was five, but he was born there. So, uh, what year? Hmm? What year? 51 with the uh, Iraqi Jewish immigration. The Ezra Nehemia. Okay. Uh, so um, I feel that what is going on in uh, Syria is back. Has a lot to do with uh, actually what's going on with Iraq and the Sunni Shiite shift of power. And I wanted to ask you about the thesis of democratization and, and freedom of the Bush administration, because it seems like Iraq is falling apart to Kurdish, Shiite, and Sunni. And there's a question about democratization and ethnic major majorities. And it seems like the, the thesis, these two clash. Like, if you want to consolidate a state, you, need, you, have, to have, you have to have an ethnic majority for the democracy thesis to work. And what about the option of breaking down the size people borders because mm. it seems to be happening anyway. We know Egypt is its own entity. We know Morocco is its own entity with its own history. But Libya, Syria, parts of Syria, Iraq, maybe Lebanon. I mean what are the main what was it uh, is it seems like the only way to reconcile the it's democracy thesis with the ethnic majority option in these in these parts. First, um, you know what we practice in the United States and what we believe in in the United States, and this is true Western Europe too, is not democracy. Period. End of statement. Um, because democracy can be taken to mean majority rule, and that's not our system. Our system is a, a constitutional system of laws that constrain majority rule. Yes, majority rule, but within lots of limits. Uh, legal and constitutional limits. Um, I would make an argument that, that um, yes, when you have a really homogeneous state, so none of these ethnic, religious issues arise, in certain ways that's easier, in certain ways. Although you can break, that's Tunisia, but you can also break down along secular, religious lines, uh, Salafis, and Ada. Um, so it doesn't solve your problem. Um, if you look at Egypt, for example, it's a homogeneous state except maybe 10% Christian. So now you have the problem of what are minority rights? What is citizenship? 
Um, I would argue in a case like Iraq, you can make a good argument for democracy as the only way to reconcile these three groups. Either they're going to reconcile democratically, vote trading and the parliament and we'll give you this money but you get this, or they'll uh, fight each other. You fight politically or you fight militarily. Better to fight politically. Um, in the after, when a state falls apart, uh, very bad things happen when there is no law and no security. And we know this for a long time. How, Iran, how did, how did it come to be that Khomeini took over? The people of Iran did not vote for Khomeini. He took over in a period of chaos. No, did they vote for the Shah? Well, the Shah collapsed and the army collapsed. And so what we learned from Iran was when the security, when, when the forces of order collapse, anybody can take over. I mean, we learned this in 1917 in Russia, when the army collapsed. We learned it in Cuba in 1959. The army collapses, anybody can take over, including some bearded guy from the mountains. This was the American tragedy or failure in Iraq, that we allowed chaos to develop. Um, but I don't, you know, even now, even today, uh, it's interesting, the Kurds have not said, we declare independence. No, Russia, I mean, anyway, effect, there's no effective power, and better for them that the Sunnis and Shiites are fighting. And maybe better for them, maybe, to be largely autonomous within Iraq, maybe. Because they have their own problems with Iran and with uh, Turkey, Turkey and, Turkey. and, and uh, even with Syria. Maybe. So it's interesting. I mean, I would, if they declare independence, I would hope the United States would back them, support their independence. They haven't done it. Maybe they'll never do it. Um, so maybe Sykes Picot doesn't in Iraq totally fall apart. But uh, <coughs> what you want for Iraq, it seems to me, is internal peace and a political system that allows them to fight and divide the spoils, the money, the oil revenue, politically. And they just, the Kurds and, and Baghdad just did that. They just reached a partial agreement on that. Oh, That's, yes, on the oil from Kirkuk. That's what you want them to do. I, I think uh, Iraq tells you, number one, <clears throat> When the security forces collapse, when law and order collapse, you're in big trouble for a long time in any country. Very hard to reestablish. That's one lesson it teaches you. Um, it reminds you that building a democracy in any Arab country is going to be very, very hard. It's not an accident that there aren't any. Maybe, maybe Tunisia now maybe will be the first. But even in the Islamic world, there are some, Indonesia, Malaysia, from time to time, Bangladesh, Turkey, from time to time, time. on and off, on and off, now going off again. Um, but it's not zero. It's only the Arabs who have had this greater problem. So it's a reminder. They, we can debate the reasons for it, but we can't debate the fact. It hasn't, it hasn't happened. Um, I don't think what it tells us is the only solution is to break up the country. Because then, by the way, you can have three non-democratic countries also. Syria, I think, very hard to put back together. Very hard at this point. Uh, Iran, two years ago, there was an, uh, on the table, there was an option of, uh, to Israel to prevent the uh, Iran nuclear power. And if, if Israel would do some action about it, how do you think that the administration would, would, would have reacted? What, what would be, what, what yeah. would do you think that could be the conscious uh, This is the, the, summer of the end of the summer these? of 2012. Yes. I actually thought a strike was more likely than not. I thought it was more than 51% likely. Yes. And obviously Barack was in favor at that point. Yes. Thought it was going to happen. What? And more um, people. 
And obviously, Israel was closer to it then than it has been. What would the United States have done? What would Iran have done, for that matter? Um, I don't think the United States would have had any choice but to basically get behind Israel and support Israel. Um, what, do you, what are the options? To say, well, you, you made your bed, now you sleep in that bed. And if the Iranians send missiles to bomb Tel Aviv, it's too bad you brought it up. This is not possible. This is not going to happen. Moreover, the Iranians are, are, it is possible that they won't just attack Israel. For example, it's possible the Iranians would say, they didn't reach here from the moon. They overflew Saudi Arabia, which is obviously complicit. The royal family of Saudi Arabia is in the pay of the Jews now. <laughs> and you attack Saudi Arabia. So then the Americans, of course, come in to help defend Saudi Arabia or the Emirates or wherever this overflight supposedly took place. It's possible the Iranians do something really stupid like close the Strait of Hormuz. And the United States, again, is involved. Um, or they commit acts of terrorism. Well, of course, we denounce all acts of terrorism. So I, I thought the United States would have to end up supporting Israel. I remember speaking to an Arab foreign minister back in the Bush years saying, we're off the record. We're having a drink. Well, what would you do? What do you think your government would do if the Israelis bomb Shia? His answer was two things. First, I would have a glass of champagne. <laughs> Second, I would fly to New York, of course, to denounce Israel in this area. I think that's actually probably right. But if what the Arabs are saying privately is, yeah. to the Americans, look, we have to have a UN resolution condemning this. It's terrific. Uh, so now how do we, what do we do now? How do we proceed? How do you help defend us against Iran, which might decide to do stupid things? So I, I, I also thought, perhaps this is too positive, what is Iran going to do? The Iranian Air Force cannot really bomb Israel. Missiles, terrorism. Well, terrorism they do anyway. They're blowing up Israeli embassies where they can anyway. Missiles at Dimona, pretty good air defenses. I don't think this is a very big risk. The risk is Hezbollah. That's the question. Yes, and we know Hezbollah. It's the question Every five is, years will be something with Hezbollah. Uh, I have had Israeli generals say to me, sooner or later we're going to have another war with Hezbollah. Yes. Might as well. It's, it's Might better, as well better do it. to do the operation before. Right. I have had Israeli analysts say, Hezbollah is busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the best moment to have yeah. a confrontation with Hezbollah. They are at war. Yeah. There are Hezbollah fighters fighting and dying in Syria. So it's a missed opportunity? The question is whether you think Israel has to do this. And how can they do it? Well, can you do it is a judgment Israeli generals will make. I think if uh, Barak well, says that he can do it, so he knows better than uh, you. Yadlin also no, said. Yes, Yadlin and people like these. Iran has uh, to believe that we can do it, whether or not yeah. we can. Well, that's the first. If you can do it, that's the question. If you can't, you can't. Yeah. Um, is it a missed opportunity? Depends on whether you think it's inevitable. If it's inevitable, it's a missed opportunity. If you believe that they can be talked, threatened, sanctioned out of doing it, or that at some point an American president will do it, then you shouldn't do it. Of course. But that's a very hard decision to make. Uh, in, in his book, in his book, uh, the Dovik Vice Plus, in his book, there's many nice things. I don't know if you read the book. It, no. it, it wasn't trusted to. It's a great book. Yes, one one thing. Maybe you were there. Uh, uh, he said Condi Rice is asking uh, uh, Sharon, what what really the problem with the Palestinians? So Sharon tells Weisler in Hebrew, Tagidla, tell her she has time to buy and have two problems. This yeah. was in English. In English. This was actually yeah. But I tell you the stories in the book. Geisler said that he translated. Tell her that they are cheaters, liars, and treacher treacherous. It's not true. It's a better story. But <laughs> 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 so that's what he said. It's in okay, the book. Okay, now let's see the other version. You should have used my version. <laughs> yes, it was he said. <laughs> we were at the ranch. 
We were having breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon is a big eater. You put food in front of Sharon, he eats, he doesn't talk. Eating doesn't is a serious chew. business. He listens. <laughs> listens to the conversation. When he finishes eating, he talks. The conversation was about how terrible the Palestinians are. Yeah. And so you had, you had a long time to eat. You had a long time to eat. And, and, and then Sharon says, in English, stop. I'm going to defend the Palestinians. So Duby, at this point, says, I hear the footsteps of the Messiah. <laughs> Sharon says, no, no, no. I know the Palestinians. I have lived with them my whole life. I was raised with them. Uh -huh. They are the most intelligent Arabs. Mm -hmm. And they have the best sense of humor. And there are two problems. The two problems are treachery and a taste for Jewish blood. He said, he says this, in he said this in English, and there was silence around the table. And then the <coughs> vice president. Silence around the table, and then Duby Weisglass said, remember, this is the defense of the Palestinians. <laughs> <laughs> he, he writes about it, but he also said there, and that's the other one, he said something interesting that um, when the uh, uh, proposal was on the table to give Abu Mazen some of the territories, Abu Mazen came back to the Americans and said, we, we cannot take it, we are not ready. He, we, he never came. It was actually Omer who made this. He never said in, that. In Omer, yes. He never came back. He never yeah. came back to Omer. No? He never came back to Omer. Partly because, you know, by the end, Omer's yeah. gone anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to go back to Turkey. Um, seems like they're, like, they don't have, they don't have any, um, any real enemies in the region right now. And uh, the question is, I, I guess, you know, are they, Direction? Are they headed towards a direction? Is there is there an eventual collision course if they become, you know, if they continue to just, you know, become more and more powerful and become the the most powerful well, state I, in the I region, mean, hegemon? I, where I think where this, is this going? If you go back to about two thousand five and six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you will find lots of articles in scholarly publications, in the Economist, in the think tank journal, about the new Ottomans. Turkey's economy is growing. Turkey's influence is growing. Um, and uh, Erdogan was pursuing this policy of no enemies anywhere. It's a complete failure. They have no influence anywhere in the Middle East. Erdogan's first project was to get rid of Assad, which he announced. And what the Turks have found is Turkey is not the United States of America. Turkey is not. NATO alone, the Turks have been unable to work their will, never mind in the region, in Syria, their neighbor. Um, Turkey, uh, Turkey's prestige in the region is diminished. And instead of having no enemies, I would say they have no friends. The Kurds are not their friends. The Iranians are not really their friends because they're Sunnis and they're fighting, they, they're fighting them in Syria. They had one real friend. Israel. And they threw that away out of what I would say is fundamentally anti-Semitism. And it really starts as soon as Erdogan takes power. He begins to move away from Israel, invisibly at the time. But we see it. We see the personnel decisions he's making. We see what's happening in the intelligence service. We see, we talk to the Turks, the Turkish army. Why did you do this? Why did you not do that? It's coming from the top. So we saw this right from the start. I think it's, it's a complete failure of a, of a foreign policy. It has gained nothing for Turkey over this period. And now he's you know, consolidating power internally in what I would call an undemocratic manner. Closing. There are more journalists in jail in Turkey than in China. It's really becoming oppressive. So he, he takes over the army. He takes over the judiciary. He takes over the press. It's a bad story internally, and I would say it's a bad story externally. So let's take two more. Um, we're talking about the sort of 
bad relations between Netanyahu and Obama. Um, and we have an election coming up. And in the past, some U.S. administrations have tried to swing the election in one way or yeah. another. Um, so I wanted to ask you if that's something that sort of you saw in administrations you worked for, and if you think the Obama administration will do something like that. We didn't do that. Um, maybe it's a Democratic Party habit. Um, we didn't do that. We didn't. We didn't. Um, well, uh, you know, Sharon and Bush came to power essentially at the same time, so Bush wouldn't have been able to do that. And uh, then came Albert, and they had a good relationship, Bush and Albert, so there would have been no reason to. So we, it was totally hands off. Um, Bush should have had a good relationship with Netanyahu, but he didn't because there were people who didn't like Netanyahu from previous years who basically soured him without his meeting, baby. Um, so I think that was unfortunate, but we did not try to have any impact, nor did we try to have any impact on the uh, election, which everybody thought Sipi would win. Um, and I don't think that happened in the Reagan administration either. I do not recall it happened a long time ago, and I don't recall it happening. I don't think Obama is able to do that now because of his own unpopularity in Israel. I think that that um, for at the um, Sabad Forum this weekend, questioned about Iran, uh, Bougie Herzog essentially associated himself with Obama policy toward Iran, and I thought that's a mistake. It's not going to win a lot of support. In Israel, what mm -hmm. Israeli voters are going to say? Well, now I'm more likely. To. <clears throat> I don't think Obama <clears throat> could. I don't see what he could do that would actually. If you assume that he would like to see that Netanyahu defeated, it's obvious. <clears throat> um, I don't know what he could do to really make that happen, except maybe endorse him. <laughs> maybe that. Well, we'll take the last two here. Okay. Okay. Actually, we have the two questions, but uh, we have one. So I'll ask you two, you can choose. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the easy one. What do you think uh, about the relationship and the future relationship uh, between uh, Qatar, uh, United States, and the Hamas, the uh, black golden triangle? And the second question is uh, more personal. You can, you can answer both of them. I mean, <laughs> if, it, if they come from you, it will be OK. Uh, uh, how did your uh, personal uh, Jewish identity uh, shaped and reshape along the years, uh, along your uh, professional career, and uh, of course uh, dealing with these uh, yeah. national issues? It's a hard question. Um, <coughs> Qatar is easy. <coughs> the United States needs to put a lot more pressure on them. The only useful form of pressure would be to start threatening seriously to move the base. We can move all that stuff to the UAE, the Emirates. That they would take seriously, because they need that base to defend them against Iran. And we should do that. I don't mean we should move the base tomorrow. I mean we should start like with a serious study that would give them pause for the first time to think, well, maybe this is serious. Maybe could this really happen? Um, because their foreign policy continues to be quite uh, Harmful. They're backing the Muslim Brotherhood, basically, in all of its versions. Of every. <clears throat> um, I guess I would distinguish, for me personally, between not Jewish religion, Jewish identity, let's say, Jewish ethnicity, Jewish, because <clears throat> the practice of Jewish, the practice of Judaism. I'm not Orthodox. The practice of Judaism. Uh, doesn't make it impossible for me to do many things that I would have to do in a government job. When I, when Condi offered me this White House job, I said to her, you have to understand one thing, I'm not going to work Saturdays. I don't mind working Sundays, but I don't want to work, if there's a war, there's a war. We had two wars, but um, <laughs> I'm not working Saturdays as a matter of principle. And she said, that's Fine. And I did miss a lot of meetings. But, you know, the world didn't come to an end. My life didn't come to an end. And she didn't hesitate in saying, that's fine. I will tell you one other just brief story. When, when I was working for Schultz in the Reagan administration, 
So the Secretary of State goes to New York for two weeks and does a million parties and meetings. And really, quite seriously, I would say, a hundred meetings. <clears throat> and gives parties. A party for the Africans, a party for the Asians, a party for the Europeans, and so forth. I was Assistant Secretary for Latin America. You have a party for the Latin Americans. And it is scheduled on a certain day. And I said to Schultz's chief assistant, um, listen, I have to say something to you. That's Rosh Hashanah. So I'm not going to be there. I am not asking for the date to be changed. You know, it's, it, it, I don't have to be at the party. The secretary's schedule is murder. But I just wanted to know. I don't want him to look up that night and say, where the hell is Elliot? The chief assistant relays this to Schultz, who says, oh, that's this is impossible. Change the date. Switch it. So. Easy, right? I mean, he didn't think twice. Of course not. Ridiculous. It's Russia. Shelf. The chief of protocol called me up and said, how dare you? How dare you change the date of the secretary's reception, his whole schedule? And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't change any dates. You have an argument, go fight with the secretary. I told him, it's the Jewish New Year, and I won't be there. Didn't want him to be surprised. She said, well, it's the same thing. Why don't you go to your rabbi and get a dispensation? <laughs> this is, by the way, she was obviously Jewish. She's obviously, Jewish. <laughs> no, no, she's she's obviously Catholic. Catholic. Obviously. She's Arab. Oh, nice. She's Arab. Uh, one of the very few Arabs at high positions. This was uh, Selma Rosdo, um, Arab woman, Christian Arab, Lebanese, who married. This is a book also? No. This, this is a different administration who married. Uh, yeah the son of, one of the sons of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Anyway, so it was very rare to have an occasion arise where the practice of Judaism had an impact. Now, Jewishness is a different question. Um, but you know, by the time you get to these days, there are a lot of Jews in the government. There are even a lot of Jews in the State Department. Um, Kissinger, there's this, and I think it was William Sapphire who told the story, the Nixon administration, so this is 1969. Mm -hmm. Kissinger and William Sapphire are saying to each other, isn't this amazing, two Jews in the middle of all this. 1969, you know, by the time Bush comes in, 2001, so 30 years later, no Jews are saying that. There have been Jews, you know, throughout the Clinton years, including, for example, Dennis Ross and Martin Indyk, Jews handling these issues. Dennis is the negotiator. Martin is the Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East. This is a bureau that was the Arabists, right? Mm -hmm. the, the heart of the opposition to Israel and the State Department, one, not by a Jew. So <clears throat> it's just not such a big deal, nor with Martin and Dennis having done this, frankly, by the time Bush is there, it's not an issue. Do you ever feel in government that your responsibilities as an American and your responsibilities as a Jew came into tension? Were there ever moments where you even asked that question? There were not. Uh, there were not. It, it's <clears throat> there are Jewish interests that, you know, there were, there were matters that interested me more than they would interest a non-Jew. Soviet Jew. Now, I wasn't in the executive branch at that time. I'm working for Senator Jackson, Senator Moynihan. They're interested for personal reasons, political reasons. In the executive branch, I cannot recall. Um, there are times when I disagreed with policy. For example, I thought the bombing of Aussie Rock was great. Um, but uh, so did a lot of people who were not Jewish. So the answer to your question is uh, no. no. I don't, I mean it's, this is a question I would like to ask Nigel Scheinwald, who was the National Security Advisor of the United Kingdom. I'd like to ask Jean-David David, who was the National Security Advisor of France. Um, I never had that, I never had a moment where I said, oh my God, 
this is a real conflict. Last one, Howard. It's our last question. So I'm trying to see from uh, this conversation whether I see some. What's your, what are your thoughts about the neocon project of exporting democracy? Is there some sort of regret about the push? Do you think it's still a good idea? Turkey was mentioned before. Of course, Erdogan has all this power because Europe and America pushed him, uh, supported his suppression of the army. There used to be a secular army that would have had a coup any time. Uh, Islamist policies there were trying to be implemented, but it's not there anymore. And yeah. it was because the idea is that the army, <clears throat> we should have civilian uh, power, same thing as in Egypt. Yeah, well, <coughs> there's a wonderful song by Edith Piaf, my favorite Edith Piaf song. Je ne regrette rien. <laughs> she does it better than I could. Um, not really. And, 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 but, you know, the examples you give are good examples. Turkey. I don't regret the United States saying we don't believe in principle in military coups. And we think that Turkey, Turkey had a democracy several times in, out, in, out. What I regret is that when Erdogan started to compromise Turkish democracy, we said nothing. He is destroying the judiciary. He is arresting journalists. But there was an organization that protected these, and, you, and the West destroyed it. There was an army. We, we didn't protected. destroy anything. We said we believed Turkey should move toward democracy. And by the way, so did Europe, and it was the only possible way to achieve what Turks said they wanted, which was to get into the EU. The mistake was that when Erdogan started to do this, we didn't fight. Mm -hmm. I don't mean with the military. I mean, we should have denounced him. We could have helped build up resistance to him. We didn't say a damn thing. And the same thing's true, I would say, in Egypt. You know, <clears throat> they had a law under King Farouk in Egypt. Many Arab monarchies have this law. It is a crime to insult the king. Nasser, Nasser took the same law. It's a crime to insult the president. Then Sadat took uh, uh, the same law, and then Mubarak. In all of the years of Farouk, Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak, there were fewer prosecutions for this crime than in one year of Mohammed Morsi. Mm -hmm. And we didn't say anything. That's what I regret. If we're going to support democracy, we have to support democracy, and human rights, and the rule of law, and independent courts. Not say, well, he won the election, so now he can do it. And it's not just Egypt. We did it. We do it everywhere. We did it in Venezuela with Chavez. We do it everywhere. If you win the election, you do it. No! We don't believe that if you win the election, you can do what you want. That's not the American system. We believe in constitutionalism. We believe in law. We believe the executive cannot do whatever it wants. You don't have a one-time plebiscite, and then you're elected king. But we have made this mistake over and over again, uh, Father Aristide in Haiti. You win the election, we shut up. That's a huge mistake, particularly in countries where the fate of democracy is very much hanging in the balance. We need to be in there. We need to be pushing. We need to be arguing. And we'd have a better record, I think. Or rather, they would have a better record if we did. And we don't. And we pay the, we, they pay and we pay a big price for it, I think. Elliot? Voila. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank mm -hmm. you.